Hey, everybody. Welcome back to uh, 162. We are um, going to continue with our discussion of I.O. And uh, to that end, um, one of the things we were talking a lot about was this idea of how a CPU, which is, of course, running the operating systems and programs, talks to a device. And we said, well, uh, there are various buses in the system. And uh, we talked particularly about the notion of a device controller. And the device controller is uh, a piece of hardware that connects directly to the device and also interfaces with the various buses. These controllers can be on PCI buses, uh, PCI Express buses. They can be USB, et cetera. And notice that um, in addition to uh, receiving commands over the bus, it also has the ability to basically talk to the CPU and give events through interrupt uh, interrupts. And that's where the interrupt controller uh, connection is. And so um, basically, all of the communication with the device is pretty much between the CPU and the device controller. Uh, and we um, specifically, as we were um, getting toward the end of the lecture last time, we're talking about a couple of different ways the CPU can communicate with a device. And one was via special instructions. Um, those special instructions being things like in B and out B or in W and out W for byte or word. And um, those special port IO instructions go to a special port address space, which is different from the regular address space. And um, mostly with the Intel processors, uh, this is a backward compatibility thing from the original IBM PCs. But what I show here as an example are some ports uh, where uh, port 20, 21, 22, 23 hex, those all uh, represent registers inside the device controller that can control the device. The other thing we talked about was memory mapped I.O. in which uh, certain addresses within the device are actually uh, mapped into physical uh, address space. And as a result, by doing reads and writes, the CPU is able to affect changes on the device. And this was an example that I gave here where maybe we're controlling a screen. And this would be local uh, physical addresses. Uh, and those physical addresses like OX8002000, um, OX8001000, et cetera, represent points at which if the processor were to, to write to those addresses, obviously they have to be mapped in a page table and then, uh, then the writes can go through, will actually cause things to happen, okay? And uh, for instance, writing to display memory here might actually cause dots to appear on the screen. Or writing to the graphics descriptor queue might allow us to assemble various uh, items in that descriptor queue that are effectively triangles for some interesting three-dimensional game or whatever. And then if we write to command or uh, register, we can say, OK, render that in three dimensions. Or maybe we can read from uh, OX0007F000 to get the status of the device. Right? And because these are in the physical address space, we can protect this with address translation. And uh, under most circumstances, perhaps you only give the kernel access to these addresses. But you could potentially give it to a process whose job it was was to control that device just by an address mapping. All right. Um, and one of the things we did talk about a bit last time, uh, as I recall, was the fact that with modern buses such as PCI and USB and so on, um, there's an automatic negotiation that happens for the actual absolute values of these addresses just to make sure that the um, physical addresses of the devices don't overlap. All right, are there any questions on that before I move forward? So we call that memory mapped IO. Okay, good. So, um, so transferring data to and from the controller as I mentioned, there's a couple, uh, we can either use ports or memory mapping, but there's another uh, axis that we can consider. One is programmed I.O. And programmed I.O. is where every byte gets transferred by the processor. So the processor goes in a tight loop and it, you know, it reads a byte and then reads the next one, reads the next one, reads the next one, reads them uh, one byte at a time or one word at a time and stores it in memory. And as you can imagine, that's expensive because the processor or core is doing that. Um, so the pros of this is it's very simple, uh, very easy to program, and um, there are some low bandwidth devices that actually interact that way. We showed you the speaker last time, getting uh, programming the speaker to get some uh, 
interesting tones out of it. But if you really want to do a lot of transferring of data, the other option is something called direct memory access, which is uh, a situation where you tell the controller, go ahead and transfer data to or from DRAM and tell me when you're done. And then the controller can go ahead and do all of those transfers on its own. So in particular, here's an example where uh, the CPU is going to try to do some I.O. from one of these disks. So the first step, the CPU is going to talk to the device driver in the kernel and say, oh, transfer this for me into some buffer in memory. And what will happen is uh, the device driver will go ahead and program a, under some circumstances a DMA controller. And that DMA controller will then reach out to the controllers for the disk. Um, and that uh, disk will individually transfer bytes back to the controller, to the DMA controller. And then the DMA controller will write these through to memory. And then when all is said and done, the DMA controller will finally cause an interrupt of some sort. And that, that's the point at which the CPU comes over. So you could kind of think of a DMA controller as uh, a part of the system that basically acts like a CPU for the, ta for the uh, action of actually transferring data. Now, these DMA controllers can either be a separate item on the bus that acts like a processor and does the transfer, or it could actually be integrated in a lot of controllers have this these days where the DMA controller aspect is integrated, for instance, in PCI. And um, things that are on the PCI bus are able, or PCI Express, are actually able to go ahead and transfer over the bus directly to memory. OK? Um, and one other thing I'll point out is, of course, if you're writing directly to memory, it's quite possible that you're going to be writing memory that is cached in the CPU. And so that's an issue where we have to be very careful because we don't want the CPU's version of the cache to get outdated relative to memory. And there are uh, at least two options there. I didn't put these on the slide. I probably should have. One is where the device driver basically flushes uh, the block entirely out of the cache before it does the DMA. The second is there is DMA hardware in a lot of devices that can simultaneously write to DRAM while invalidating the cache. And that's another way to make sure this stays coherent. OK, questions? So direct memory access is an important way to get really high bandwidth communication between devices and memory. And it leaves the processor out of the picture. OK, so um, how do we find out that we're done or that, for instance, the device is, needs some service of some sort? So um, you know, examples where the operating system needs to know is when the device has completed a DMA operation, or if we ask the disk to do a write, we need to know when that's done. The other is when maybe there was an error encountered. Okay, um, And so the simple thing to do is for the device to actually generate an interrupt. And um, we talked a lot about interrupt controllers kind of in the first several lectures of the class. So uh, mostly we were talking about timer interrupts. but the device interrupt is similar. It goes through the uh, interrupt controller and uh, causes a dispatch to an interrupt handler that would handle that particular interrupt. And uh, if it's a disk, for instance, maybe the disk uh, generates an interrupt when it's done transferring. And at that point, uh, the operating system wakes up in an interrupt handler and perhaps it uh, finds a process that's busy waiting for the interrupt to happen or for the device transfer to happen and it wakes that process up and puts it back on the ready queue. So the pros of interrupts are it can handle really it can handle unpredictable events really well because uh, you know you don't have any overhead until it's time for the interrupt. So that's great. Uh, the downside is that an interrupt, of course, is a transfer into the kernel. And uh, you have to save, you change the stack, you have to save a bunch of stuff on the stack. Um, there's a, a bunch of other overhead there. And so interrupts can be rather relatively high overhead. And if you have something that's generating lots of interrupts uh, on a regular basis, uh, that could be expensive. And perhaps an interrupt isn't the right thing at that point. The alternative is something called polling. And the idea behind polling is periodically the operating system just looks at a register in the device, maybe by using uh, I.O. instructions like we talked about, or um, by reading from memory mapped I.O. from uh, some register in the device controller. And uh, it periodically checks this. And when there's a bit set in some register, it knows that the uh, transfer is done and it can continue. 
So the idea behind interrupts versus polling, these are uh, duels of each other. They're different ways of getting information out of a device. You can imagine the downside of polling, of course, is that um, if the device isn't ready, you've just wasted time looking at the device. And so, um, so the pros of this is it's really low overhead because you don't actually have to save and restore a bunch of registers. You're just checking a register out on a device. The con is you can waste cycles if uh, a device is infrequently ready. And so actual devices actually combine both polling and interrupts. A great example of this is uh, a really high bandwidth network that let's say a 10 gigabit or 40 gigabit or even 100 gigabit per second networks these days. Uh, if you had a, an interrupt on every packet, you'd be in trouble. However, as soon as an interrupt occurs, you enter the, the network uh, driver portion. And what it does is it uh, pulls all of the packets out, um, including the one that originally called the interrupt, but all the remaining ones as well. So that's a form of polling. And then it re-enables interrupts when it's done. So it, it uh, takes the first interrupt, it polls to pull all the packets out, and then it continues. And this is how you can basically allow something as high bandwidth as say 100 gigabit per second network to actually um, not overload a processor. Okay, great. So now um, let's take a look a little bit more. We've seen this picture earlier in the term, um, but if you, if you look at the typical kernel like Linux or whatever, uh, Pintos, you'll see that there's the system call interface, which is the uh, dividing line between user code above and the kernel below. So the kernel is all in blue. And there's a bunch of different uh, facilities inside the kernel. We talked a lot about process management and memory management uh, in previous uh, parts of the term. And we're actually going to be um, talking further about file systems. That's our next topic uh, starting next week. And then we have uh, other devices, networking we talked a bit about, but we'll, we'll also talk more about that uh, in the coming weeks. There's a question here, does the device or the OS decide whether to do polling or interrupts? It turns out, that's a good question. It turns out that um, the device typically provides both as an option and whether you're polling or interrupts is really, doing interrupts is really a question of whether interrupts are enabled or not. And so the operating system can make that decision. They can decide to always disable interrupts and only poll or leave the interrupt enabled until the first one occurs. And of course, the first thing that happens on an interrupt is it disables everything. And uh, the kernel could choose to keep it disabled for a while while it's polling, et cetera. So that's, a, that's purely the um, act of the OS to make a decision about whether to do interrupts or polling. So if you look at this uh, picture that we've got here, there's kind of the, um, yes, you can selectively disable interrupts as well. Um, that's a good question. The, uh, if you take a look at the interrupt controller, there's typically a mask that lets you decide which interrupts are enabled and which are disabled. If you look at this figure, um, you see that the top half of this figure is got a standard interface, which is that open, close, read, write uh, interface where sort of everything looks like a file in Linux. But then there's a bunch of interesting things below the covers. And um, we need to talk more about that as we go on um, and how we, that allows us to basically get uh, the standardized interface above, okay? So um, the, our next topic is gonna talk about some IO devices and specifically we're gonna talk about ones that can serve as uh, storage devices, okay? Now, um, if you remember the idea behind a device driver, which is gonna be something in the lower portion of the kernel here, is that the device driver basically has that device specific code in the kernel that interacts directly with the device hardware through the device controller, which we've talked about now. And it supports that standard internal interface up to uh, the higher levels of the kernel. And, um, and that's important uh, because it makes the higher levels of the kernel much simpler. And if you remember, we had this discussion uh, early in the term, the device driver typically divided into a top and a bottom half. And the top half is accessed in the call path from system calls um, down to uh, making a decision about whether the device itself needs to be uh, acted upon. And so uh, the top half implements things like open, close, read, write, um, the ioctal system call, something called strategy, which is a, um, a routine that starts communication with the device itself. And um, 
really what, what makes it into the top half is typically a process that's trying to do some sort of IO will work its way into the top half to do the IO and potentially things get to sleep there if uh, the device has to be invoked. The bottom half runs as an interrupt routine and it gets it, its interrupts uh, from the device and makes a decision what to do next. Okay, and I showed you this figure, this should look familiar now. So above the system call interface, which is the user program portion, we might make a decision to do a request. How would we do that? We might do a read or a write system call. Okay, and that goes across the boundary. And at that point, we might say, well, could we already satisfy the request? So what might be a situation where we could already satisfy the request without ever talking to the device? Anybody have any ideas there? Okay, cache, good. So that it's a specific type of cache. It's caching the, uh, the device contents, okay? And that's what's called the block cache. We haven't actually talked about that one yet, but we'll get to it. Um, and so, yes. Now, if you remember, this interface for reads and writes is a byte-oriented interface, right? So you can read five bytes from a file, but the blocks, as we're gonna talk about in a moment, underneath from the, say, the disk are all 4K bytes at a time. And so we need a place to put the blocks that we've only partially read, and that'll be the block, the block cache. And so it could be that we uh, can already handle stuff from the cache. Otherwise, we're gonna send uh, the request to the device driver, and the device driver is going to um, figure out what needs to be invoked, and it's potentially gonna put the process to sleep on a wait queue associated with, say, the disk. And then it's gonna um, invoke the scheduler to wake up something that's already on the ready queue. And um, of course, at that point, it will uh, have something else running while we're doing the IO, okay? And so that's the top half of the device driver, and it's gonna send uh, commands and invoke the strategy routine uh, to send stuff to the device hardware, at which point um, the hardware is just gonna do its thing, okay? So the controller of a disk drive, for instance, will start uh, the heads moving, and at some point the, the uh, operation will complete, and uh, it will then uh, generate a completion interrupt. Um, the bottom half will receive the interrupt. It'll figure out uh, who needed that data, and um, it will wake it up transfer it into the user's buffers and we complete. And at that point, we've gone uh, the full gamut from the original request to the response. Okay, so hopefully that's familiar to anybody. Do we have any questions? Okay, and by the way, that decision between polling versus interrupts can happen partially in this top half of the device driver. So. Um, this top half of the device driver could decide to disable interrupts and start polling the device and asking it for data, in which case we wouldn't go to the bottom half. We would be kind of working between the top half and the, and the device itself. The other thing is when that, um, if the device is giving an unsolicited interrupt because say it's a network card and there's a network packet coming in, then we would come into the bottom half. And at that point, there might be a decision made to, um, to start polling, okay? And if you notice in the network case, what's interesting there is you don't have a process that's requested anything. Instead, you have a, an unsolicited packet coming in. And so the bottom half of the network device has to do a demultiplexing where it figures out kind of which socket a packet is uh, headed for, okay? So that's a topic for another, another lecture. So is the device driver part of the device or the operating system? So the device driver is definitely part of the operating system. Um, devices, however, have specific requirements. And so a device driver comes with a, with a device, uh, and, but it's uh, unique based on the operating system. So the device driver for Windows is gonna look, look a little bit different than the one from you know, Linux or uh, Apple iOS. And mostly that's because of its interface with the upper levels of the kernel much of the lower level logic is gonna be the same, but it's definitely part of the operating system, okay? Um, and the bottom half is not the same as the device controller, okay? So uh, this is all software I'm showing you on this screen. So um, I know this is, a, this is a software class, but in this instance, you need to keep track of the hardware itself is actually the device controller plus say the disc and the bottom, top and bottom half is actually uh, the, the software in the operating system that interacts with the hardware. 
All right, great. So the goals of the IO subsystem are to provide a uni uniform interfaces despite wide ranging different devices. So as we already talked about the fact that we can F open slash dev slash something, you guys should all look at slash dev sometimes, uh, that things that are in the, de the dev uh, subdirectory actually are devices. And you can go ahead and do this for loop reading something directly out of say the keyboard by going to the right slash dev uh, file. And that interface would work the same if you were talking to a keyboard, if you were talking to a network, or if you were talking to other things. And so that's the, that's the standardized interface that we're looking for, okay? And um, it's that device driver, the fact that the device driver provides standardized interfaces facing up really allows us to do that. And we're gonna try to get a flavor for what's involved in actually controlling devices um, as we go through, but we can only scratch the surface here. Um, so first of all, the, there are several different types of devices and they're loosely divided up into three categories here. So the first category of block devices like disk drives, tape drives, DVDs. Um, and these are devices which present blocks of data to the uh, operating system, okay? And that's because the underlying device itself is block-based. So if you look inside a, a disk drive, what you'll see is a bunch of platters. We'll talk about that in a moment. And each platter has a set of sectors which are combined together into blocks. Um, and you can't read a byte off of the disk. You have to write, read a chunk off the disk, okay? And so that's a block device. And uh, character devices, on the other hand, are fundamentally byte-oriented. And so you can get a byte out of a keyboard or a mouse or serial ports, et cetera, some of the USB devices. And so the block devices, yes, you've got open, read, write, seek. Um, but when you're uh, fundamentally pulling from the raw device interfaces, you're going to get a whole block at a time. Character devices, uh, there are things like get and put, which lets you get single characters. Okay. Now, raw interfaces are not the ones we're used to. We're really used to. Um, for instance, on the block devices, you're typically going through a file system. The file system goes the, the additional mile of making sure that uh, even though the devices have blocks, uh, that you can read three bytes from a file. And that's going to be something above the block device interface. And in fact, if I go back here for a second, let's just do that to my little green figure. If you notice uh, on this in the file systems, we got the block devices down here. The file system, which we're going to talk about as one of our next topics, takes these blocks, which are scattered all over the disk potentially, and reassembles them into uh, what I'll call uh, bags of bytes that you can then read and write, which is what we think of as files and what we think of as living in a namespace uh, for files. Okay, And so that's going to be the file system. These other devices, which are fundamentally serial, um, those things uh, have a pretty direct uh, interface up because they're already byte oriented like the interface uh, that is provided above the system call interface. All right. Now, so the last type is the network device. Now you might think that networks ought to be either block or character devices, but it turns out they're treated as a, as a separate type of device, mostly because of the way they work. Okay, and the way they work is they have sockets which receive uh, things off of networks. And then those sockets, uh, there's a, like we mentioned earlier, there is a um, unsolicited packets come in and get resorted into sockets and so on. And so those interfaces are a little different from both block and character devices. And so these network devices like ethernet and wireless and Bluetooth and you name your favorite communication protocol um, basically are considered network devices. And they're pretty much interacted with as FIFOs or pipes or streams of uh, a bytes, okay? Or if you think of them in terms of, of uh, mailboxes or, or um, packets, those packets are not of fixed size. Whereas with the block devices, those packets are always, you know, say 4K or something like that, okay? All right. So how does the user deal with timing uh, down uh, from, the, from the kernel, uh, excuse me, from above the system call interface? Well. Up till now, you've been pretty much been dealing with the blocking interface, which means that if I go to do a read, uh, what happens is the read system call waits until the data is back. Okay, and it, basically this process is put to sleep until the data is ready. And in the case of a write, 
This doesn't happen as often, but if there's not enough buffer space or whatever, uh, it'll put the process to sleep until it can officially do a write. Okay, so that is um, what you're used to, the blocking interface. And uh, it's what I also talked about when we just talked about that, uh, that diagram with the device driver. There are two other options here, which are actually available often by calling ioctals with the, with the right parameters on a, a file you've already opened. So one is a non-blocking interface, and that's the don't wait interface. And what happens there is if you do a read or write and you say, I would like five bytes, it will look and it'll immediately return regardless of how many bytes are available. Um, and it potentially will give you back zero if there's nothing available. Or maybe if you asked for five, it might only give you three. So this interface is intended to be used in a polling fashion, where what you're going to do is you're going to keep asking until you get what you want, but you don't want to block. You want to be doing something else, and then you come back and ask again if you didn't get everything you want. So that's the don't wait interface. Okay, And uh, oftentimes, you can turn a blocking interface into a non-blocking interface with the right ioctal calls, OK? Finally, there's the asynchronous interface, which is a little different than non-blocking. Asynchronous says, tell me later. And so what you do there is you give it a buffer, and you say, I would like 10 bytes. And it will return immediately, regardless of whether the data is there. But then later, via something like a signal, it'll say, hey, your data is ready. And at that point, you can look in the buffer. So notice how the top two here are very similar to what you're used to, OK? Um, the bottom is very different in that you've given it a buffer, and then later you go back and look in the buffer, OK? So these three things are the interface from the user to the kernel, OK? Um, the interface between the kernel and the device is, is what's handled in the device driver. And that's very, uh, very asynchronous, because it's all event-driven. And um, the notion of blocking and non-blocking, putting things to, to sleep, is really a notion uh, of the process level above at the user level, all right? Did that answer that question? So um, now uh, let's talk about storage devices because uh, they're, they're our topic now, and we're going to move into file systems afterwards. Um, there's, there's at least two uh, types of storage device that you're going to run into on a daily basis, magnetic disks and flash memory. Um, if we were 20 years ago, I might say tape, okay? I have randomly scattered tape in there to see if anybody would notice, um, but tapes are much less used than they used to be. But the notion of a, uh, a magnetic disk is really storage that very rarely becomes corrupted. It's very large capacity. Um, it provides block level random access. And I'll tell you about a shingled magnetic uh, recording in a moment that is a little different than that. Um, the performance is very slow if you try to randomly access it, but it's still possible. And it's much better performances for se sequential accesses, OK? Um, and SMRs have very good storage density, yes, indeed. So flash memory uh, is it's slightly different. OK, so in flash memory, this is uh, becoming increasingly high density. Excuse me, it's still about five times disk cost, but those they're converging. Um, block level random access is very fast. Uh, good performance for reads, a little worse for writes in typical flash. Um, and uh, it's got some weirdnesses that you probably haven't thought about in terms of how to overwrite blocks, OK? And the most important thing I, for me, I would say, from flash memory standpoint, is a wear problem. So if you write flash too often, uh, you can actually wear it out, all right? And it'll stop losing bits. OK, so let's look at hard disk drives. So a hard disk drive is kind of fun to open up. If you were to open one up, uh, you, you'll make sure you copy all your data first, because you will um, not only void your warranty, but you will void your data. But if you look on the inside, there's a set of platters and a set of heads. Okay, And I show a picture of a read-write head over here on the far right. And those heads are pretty sophisticated. Okay, And they move as a whole uh, in and out to reach different parts of the platter, and they move together. So you'll have a head on each side of the platter, and then um, a head on each side of every platter. And then they move together uh, to get into different tracks, which I'll show you in a moment. Okay. And um, what's kind of fun is the IBM personal computer way back when had about a 30 megabyte hard disk for 500 bucks. Um, we'll show you some modern equivalents, uh, like an 18 terabyte drive, uh, which has a, 
much more, much more data on it, right? <laughs> um, I, I always like to show this because this is fun. When I was first starting as a faculty member, um, these were new drives that had just come out. And this is a form factor for um, flash for cameras. Okay, it's the larger form factor than you get today. Uh, but inside of this little chip is actually a single spinning uh, platter with, with uh, double-sided heads. And um, it actually, you could plug this into a camera and the camera wouldn't know the difference between this and a regular flash drive. Um, and it's actually a disk drive. And at the time, you could get four gigabytes out of this and you weren't getting anything close to that out of flash. So this was a huge increase in uh, density for uh, that form factor. Um, pretty cool. Now, um, they stopped being made probably in 2000. Four or, or whatever, because they it, maybe six. It got to the point where um, flash was far more uh, dense, and so this this kind of lost its uh, its market. Okay. Now, so what? Let's look a little bit more about disks. Okay. So a series of platters. They're all in a spindle. Spindle rotates uh, as a whole, and it rotates at a constant speed, except for starting and stopping. And the reason for that is there's a lot of uh, momentum, angular momentum in this. And so it takes a lot of work to spin it up and spin it down. And so you can't make it faster or slower while you're using it. You usually only spin it up and leave it because uh, spinning up and down takes a lot of energy. Um, and then you have the heads. And the heads um, are at a particular part, which uh, is called a track. And so if you, if you take a full ring, uh, which is what happens if you leave the head alone and you spin, spin the disk, that the whole thing is called a track. All right, and everything underneath um, is a cylinder. So all of the, the whole rings that are together, uh, that's called a cylinder. Any individual surface has a track. And then these little chunks called sectors are the minimum transfer uh, piece for a disk. And so these sectors um, up until fairly recently were almost all 512 bytes. And the operating system would combine a bunch of them together into something we call a block, which would be 4K. Today, um, a lot of the really high density disks now have a sector size that's closer to 4K. Okay, um, so disk tracks can be a micron wide, um, which is close to the wavelength of light. Uh, the resolution of the human eye is 50 microns, so you can't even see all the tracks here. Um, and so you can get 100K or more tracks on a typical disk, which is pretty impressive. Um, and uh, typically the tracks are separated by unused guard regions that um, make sure that while you're writing one track, you're not messing up the data on a, uh, a, um, an adjacent track, okay? So the track length, interestingly enough, varies across. Well, that's just, um, you know, that's just because we're talking about a circle here, right? So on the outside, the size of a track is larger than on the inside. So hopefully that's uh, not too surprising to anybody. What is surprising is the following. If we were to use time to define our sectors, so you basically, you write for a little while uh, and you write your 500 bytes for some amount of time and that's your sector. Can anybody tell me about the difference in size of a sector between the inner tracks and the outer tracks? Yeah, the outer sectors would be larger. And if I have 512 bytes on an inner sector, and I look at the outer sector, are the bytes or bits, let's say, on the outer sectors, would they be as close together as they are on the inner sectors? Okay, the answer would be more space. And it's actually not gonna be more space between bits, but rather the bits are gonna be longer. So um, that was the way the original disks work, but that wastes a lot of density on the outside because what's defined uh, what defines the amount of storage you can put on a disk is how densely can I put the bits together in this magnetic media and still get them back when I'm done? Because obviously um, we want to have our disks not be write only, right? That would be kind of unfortunate. And so using modern uh, digital signal processing, what happens is we can actually on the outside, we write the bits faster than on the inside to keep the density constant, okay? And so the density of bits Per, uh, per square inch is basically the same across the whole uh, disk head or across the whole disk surface. And to do that, we write 
faster, and therefore there are actually more sectors on the outside than on the inside, and the bit rate is higher on the outside than the inside. So if we were really interested in high performing, uh, the highest performing disk drive aspect for a given disk drive, we could write on the outside tracks instead of the inside tracks. All right. Now today, uh, the disks are so big, you can put so much on a disk that the time it takes to pull all the data off the disk is so long that you, you can't justify backing data up that way. It just takes too long. And so a, a few years ago, companies like Google started doing the following. They would keep archival data on part of the disk and uh, active data on a different part. And that was just so that they could back up the active data and they wouldn't even use the whole disk for active data. Okay, and that's just because it takes so long to pull all the data off. They're so big. Now, um, an interesting uh, variant, I will say, is the way I've been describing this is every track is separate. So it's a set of con concentric rings. Okay, and um, single magnetic recording is a little different. And what we do there is we actually write over, every track writes over half of the previous track. Okay. And the reason to do this is, A, you get the tracks closer together. And now you might say, but wait a minute, now I'm intermingling the track, track n and track n plus 1. And the reason this can work is basically because a really good DSP can figure this out okay, and figure out what the bits are. However, the downside is, whereas with, whereas with this, I can rewrite individual sectors anything I want. I could write a few. You know, I could rewrite this sector and then go over and rewrite that sector and rewrite a sector somewhere else and not have to disturb anything else on the disk. With SMR, I get a lot of density, but I have to rewrite whole regions because I, if I want to change anything in, say, the top track, I have to write it and then I have to write the, the other tracks. Okay. Um, the larger rectangle at the bottom here is just, you're talking about on uh, the conventional right at the top here, Nicholas? So this is showing you the difference between a regular uh, system where our tracks are defined by these uh, gray um, things here, and whereas uh, the, the shingle overwrites each other, okay? And the overlapping tracks are what we're talking about here. Um, are you talking about this very bottom one? Very left of the diagram. I'm not sure which one. So the, the larger right rectangle down at the bottom here is just showing you what's continuing. This is not, this is not saying that uh, um, we don't overlap this one. At some point, we have groups of these shingled um, rights, and there is a bottom one, and then we put a bunch of space and so on, because that defines sort of the maximum uh, that we have to rewrite to write something in the middle. OK. Oh, this guy. Um, uh, this is showing you that when you write, you need to have a large rectangle because the, the writing head uh, spans a, a larger amount of space. The read head can look at a very narrow space. So that's kind of showing you how much of the disk gets modified. If you look, the writer is this wide thing there. All right. OK. Um, the other thing I wanted to say that's pretty interesting here is these disks are all hermetically sealed, OK, which means you can't open them up. and uh, Part of the reason is that this is spinning very fast, and these heads are actually flying on a um, on air just above the the disk. Okay, so they're they're actually floating a little bit above because of the speed of the disk is causing uh, causing a an effect that uh, kind of like a Bernoulli effect almost. It lifts the head off just enough uh, so that it's very close, so we can get very dense recording. Now today uh, the bits have gotten so dense. And the, so that the disks have to be close, so close to the heads that they've, and they need to spin them up so fast that they've started actually using helium instead of uh, just regular um, air in there. So they pump it out and they put in helium, and that's basically um, what's inside those disk drives now. So if you open it up, you're going to completely break it. Okay, so if we look at uh, a disk here now, we can define it. Um, by A, the cylinders, so that's all the tracks up on top of each other. And remember, the heads are moving as a group together. Um, and then we can talk about the seek time, which is the time to move the head in to the right cylinder. Um, and so suppose we wanted to get some sector on the top, head, uh, the top platter, well, we would, the top side of the top platter, what we would do is we'd first move the head into that track 
Then the rotational latency would be we would wait for uh, the sector I want to rotate underneath the head. And then, last but not least, we would transfer the bits that are under the head, and that would give us our data. Okay, And so if we wanted to sort of model the time here, what we would say is, well, look, we've got a queue, we've got the controller, and we've got the disk. And so the time to get the request out would be the time that it sits in the queue. And we'll, uh, I don't know if we'll get entirely to queues uh, today. I think we might. But um, the time it sits in the queue, the time it gets through the controller, OK, that's queuing time, but controller time. And then on the disk itself, the time to seek, the time to rotate, and the time to transfer. Okay. And as you can imagine, the rotational latency is going to be defined by the probability of where you are on, uh, you know, on the track when you get there. So if I were trying to model rotational latency in this equation, what would I do? I mean, how would I do that? Does anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, very good. We would start with uh, taking the rotational time, which is defined by how fast that's spinning. So a, a typical time is like 7,200 RPM or 3,600 RPM. We'd use that, and that would let us figure out how long it takes to go all the way around. And then on average, we'd say it takes half that time. And that's the number we would plug in there to the rotation time. Good. So here's some typical numbers, just so you see. So space or density. So space might be 14 terabytes. Actually, I'll show you an 18 terabyte one in a moment that just came out uh, literally this month. Um, uh, this old one uh, from a couple of years ago had eight platters in a three and a half inch form factor, which is pretty crazy. The density, which is the number of bits in a square inch, is one more than one terabit per square inch, which is just nuts. Um, and that's with helium uh, filled disks and a, uh, a vertical uh, recording domains where the, the actual bits themselves kind of go into the platter rather than uh, sideways. The average seek time is somewhere from about four to six milliseconds. So if you look here, that's how long it takes on average to move the head around to get it to where you want. Okay. Um, the average rotational latency, so most desktop uh, drives are in the 3600 to 7200 RPM. The faster you go, the more energy you use. Um, and that's one of the reasons that helium is used, because it provides less resistance, and so you can go faster with less power. Um, server disks typically get up to 15,000 RPM. So you can imagine that the server disks are using a lot of energy, but are faster. Okay. Um, and uh, in the you know, 3600 is about 16 millisecond rotation time. Okay. Um, controller time depends on the controller har hardware. Um, the transfer time can be somewhere between 50 and 250 megabytes per second to transfer um, data off the disk. Okay. And the transfer size at minimums a sector, which is 512 to one kilobytes. But usually the disk, uh, the operating system pulls many uh, together. And so it will never transfer less than, say, four kilobytes in a row at a time. OK. All right. Um, the diameters range from an inch to five and a quarter inches. But really, the three and a half and two and a half inch form factors are pretty, uh, pretty common these days. OK. And the cost used to drop by a factor of two every uh, one and a half years. It's slowing down a little bit. All right. Now, here's some performance. So let's, uh, we have to ignore queuing time because that's going to take a whole discussion and controller time is easy to imagine. But let's see if we can figure something out here. Suppose the average seek time is five milliseconds. If we have a 7,200 RPM disk, so the time to rotation is uh, 60,000 milliseconds per minute, okay? Over 7,200 re uh, revolutions per minute gives us about eight milliseconds to go all the way around, okay? And notice how I've got my units set up. This is something you should remember from high school chemistry. So I have milliseconds per minute and revolutions per minute. The minutes are going to cancel, and I end up with uh, milliseconds per revolution. All right. Um, if a transfer rate is 50 megabytes and the block size is 4 kilobytes, then I can put all this together, and I can find out that it's about 0 0.082 milliseconds to get um, a sector out. Okay. All right. Now, um, 
to read blocks uh, from a random place on the disk. Notice how um, this is going to be uh, seek time, uh, rotational delay, and transfer time. And if I put those all together, that seek time of five milliseconds is, is expensive. And so we're going to end up with about nine milliseconds. And so notice the transfer time actually is hardly even in the picture here. Um, the seek time and the rotational delay, which is half of eight milliseconds, notice, is the thing that's really costing us here. And if we uh, randomly go on disk, we can get about 451 kilobytes per second out of that. On the other hand, um, if we read from a random place in the same cylinder, Notice that um, we don't have to seek because we're in the same cylinder. We get the rotational delay, 4 milliseconds, transfer time, 0.08 milliseconds. Now we're up to about a megabyte per second. Notice the difference. We almost doubled our uh, bandwidth coming off the disk just by uh, getting it from the same cylinder. So you can see it's extremely important to avoid seek time. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, seek times can be up um, in 8 millisecond range as well. Reading the next block on the same track, which is basically no seek time, no rotational delay, we can get that 50 megabytes per second back. So notice that this is going to tell us something. If we build a file system out of disks, it's going to be extremely important to do as much sequential reading as we possibly can. And then if we can't do that, staying on the same track, and then if worse comes to worse, seeking. And so we're going to want to build our file systems to really do a good job of keeping locality on the disk. Otherwise, our performance is going to go way down. And when we start getting into file systems, you're going to see why that's important. OK. Now, um, I just said that. So lots of intelligence in the controller. So sectors have all sorts of sophisticated error correction. So there's far more bits on the sector itself, including an error correction code then um, then you actually are writing on the disk and they help to to find the bits when they get errors in them um, we can do something called sector sparing which is uh, take bad sectors and transparently use something somewhere else on the disk without telling you okay we can do slip sparring which is uh, remapping a whole bunch of sectors to a completely different track if there's a problem we can skew our tracks so that the sector number is offset from one track to another all of this stuff is done by the controller. So although we're going to talk about ways of building file systems to optimize for the physical location of the heads on the disk, there is a lot of intelligence already in a modern controller that's going to be competing with you. And so um, that's something we're going to talk about when we get to that point. Okay. Now, hard drive prices over time have done really well. Um, up until about the 2012s or so, and then it start, started um, uh, flattening out a little bit. And part of this was that they were getting to be so large that, um, that uh, there was a much smaller market for those really huge disks. Another problem that was really rearing its head about the early 2000s was uh, that, that the bits were getting so close together that um, the uh, just the random energetics of heat uh, would scramble your bits and you would lose them if you tried to make the bits any smaller. Um, one of the things that made a really big, really big uh, advance on that was uh, vertically recording the domains that really helped a lot to make things more dense. Um, now, I wanted to show you a current hard disk drive if you wanted to know what the state of the art is. So the Seagate, um, for instance, an Exos X18, this is a, um, couldn't be a server drive, but it's a three and a half inch platter uh, and 18 terabytes. It's got nine platters and 18 heads. It's helium filled to reduce friction. Um, it's got a four millisecond average seek time. Uh, the, the sector itself is four kilobytes. Um, it's 7,200 RPMs. It's got very fast um, interfaces. So for instance, if you get the SAS interface, you can get dual 12 gigabit per second off of it. Um, and you can sustain 270 megabytes per second coming off the disk. OK. So um, the other thing is there's actually D DRAM cache on the disk itself to help make things faster, 256 megabytes. So if in case you were under the impression somehow that um, a disk was just a simple thing with a bunch of platters and a head on it. In fact, it's much more than that. These controllers are extremely sophisticated. There are many miniature OSs in themselves. And um, 
there's even caching on, on the controller. And notice that the price for this guy, I just looked it up on Amazon, 562 bucks. So that's about $0.03 uh, dollars or three cents a gigabyte. If you look at um, the original IBM per, uh, personal computer, it was a 30 megabyte hard disk. Um, the seek time was 30 to 40 milliseconds. Notice that's a factor of 10 difference. Um, you could get maybe 0.7 or one megabyte per second off of that. So compare that with 270. And then the price was 500, so it wasn't all that different. But because it was so small, we were talking, telling about uh, uh, $17,000 per gigabyte. So that was a, um, a lot more uh, cost per, per byte. So you guys have it easy these days. Now, uh, let's talk about a different type of disk. So are there any other questions about spinning storage? Be a good time to ask if there was something you were wondering about. What's the cache for? Well, the cache, among other things, helps uh, make the access to the disk a lot faster. So remember when I said that uh, if you were to randomly read, it's really slow. So what happens typically is these caches are actually used for what are called track buffers. And so when you go to do a read, it actually reads the whole track into the cache. And then when you go and read random parts off the, tr the track, you get much faster access. So this is different. The question is, is this the same as a hybrid disk? And the answer is no. A typical hybrid disk actually has flash memory on here as well. And the good thing about the flash memory is it means that writes are really fast and don't have to be committed to the spinning storage immediately. So you get much faster uh, access out of it. All right, good. Now, solid state disks. Uh, have been around for forever. So 1995, uh, they started coming out as a way of re replacing basically rotating media with uh, non-volatile memory. Originally, that was DRAM, okay? And it was DRAM with a battery. So if you look on, on a card like this, there's there was typically a battery back there that basically kept the DRAM's contents when nothing was uh, on, okay? But around 2009, we started getting NAND uh, flash memory, which had a couple of levels to it and started making the, the, uh, the flash dense enough to be interesting as a storage media in and of itself. And uh, the idea behind NAND, behind flash in general, is that trapped electrons distinguish between one and zero. And so when you program flash, you're actually trapping some electrons if you want a one or not trapping them if you want a zero. And um, that's how you distinguish. Okay, and what that really tells you, hopefully, is that um, before you can write, you actually have to race everything, which is get rid of all the electrons, and then you selectively uh, write them. And we'll say more about that in a moment. The positive thing about this is there are no moving parts. So um, the failure modes are, uh, at least in theory, a lot better than a system with motors that are, are running. Um, it turned out originally, the flash uh, disks in say, I'll, I'm gonna say, not originally, but let's say in the 2000, maybe 12 timeframe where people were really starting to put them on laptops and so on because there was such low power and they, in theory, were more reliable. It actually turned out that there were some companies that had some weird failure modes that would just all of a sudden take a, um, I'm gonna say a, you know, a, a hundred gigabyte flash disk would suddenly look like it was only eight kilobytes and all your data would be gone. That happened to me on uh, one of my laptops where I was an early adopter on flash memory. Fortunately, the uh, SSDs are much better now. Okay. Um, rapid advances in capacity and cost ever since. Uh, the downside of SSDs, they're good on power. They're a little slower to write than read, but they also wear out. So the more you write them, the more you lose your data. Okay, and so that's a, that's a slight downside to SSDs. Now, let me just show you a little bit about how this works. So typically you have a host, which is the CPU talking over a, over a data bus like SATA, and you have some, uh, on the controller, you actually, uh, you have uh, in the controller, you have a buffer manager, which makes it look like a disk drive so that the host can ignore that it's something separate if it wants to. And then you have the flash memory controller also on that that controls all the flash. And what the flash memory controller does is it reads or writes four kilobyte pages 
maybe say 25 microseconds or so. And what's interesting about that is that means that even though in principle you got all the bits are stored individually, you still have four kilobyte pages that are coming off. So it looks a lot like a disk from that standpoint, except we don't ever have any seek or rotational latency because we're, we're not moving ahead in and we're not having to wait for things to spin. Okay, so you can imagine that random access is much faster here in general. Okay, and our, our model for latency here is queuing time plus controller time plus transfer time. Um, and this has the highest bandwidth regardless of whether you're sequential or random. So that actually has some impact on how you build a file system because you don't have to do that optimization for locality you did otherwise. And uh, I'm gonna make sure to have a couple of slides that I'll put in when we talk about file systems about how this changes file systems because there are some new ones that are related to this, all right? Now, uh, writing is a very complex operation, okay? Because in order to write, first of all, we have to have empty pages, okay? Because we can't write uh, over something that's already been written because the only thing we can do is add electrons. So the, write, the erasing process is high energy uh, removal of the electrons and then you can add the extra ones to do the writes. And furthermore, you can only erase in big chunks, okay? So the big blocks that you erase might be, for instance, a 256 kilobyte block, and then you can write in four kilobyte pages, okay? And so you can imagine that one tricky part about a file system for this is we need to make sure we have enough erased blocks that when we're ready to, to write some new blocks, we can find enough pages to, to deal with it. And then we have to make sure that when we're done with all of the pages in a block, or we have to track enough to know when we're done, then we can go ahead and do the erasing so that they're ready for the next time we need them. So the free list management on um, the uh, SSD can get tricky, okay? Because it's not just blocks, it's also, or it's not just pages, it's also blocks, okay? The other thing is that the rule of thumb on Flash is that uh, erasure, is about 10 times uh, the speed of writes and writes are about, excuse me, erasure is about 10 times as slow as writes and writes are about 10 times as slow as reads. So it's really slow to write, it's fast to read. And so um, this actually has that variation where writes uh, are slower, erases are a lot slower. And so you have to be uh, keep that in mind if you can uh, to try to avoid writing until you really need to. The other thing is writes take power. Okay, and so the more you write flash, you're using a lot more energy than reading. Okay, so writes do not include erasure, no. All right, so you have to do erasure separately. Now, um, so the architecture, SSDs give you the same interface as hard disk drives uh, to the operating system. So you're reading and writing chunks of four kilobytes. Oh, by the way, some of that erasure uh, interface is hidden uh, in the controller. And so um, the reading and writing, to, to some extent, the OS can ignore uh, this distinction. But if an OS really wants to do the right thing, it wants to know about this, uh, this distinction. Okay, but the part of the, the SSD controller helps, helps you a little bit with this. Um, so you can only overwrite data 256 kilobytes at a time. You can never overwrite a page that you've written before. It's gotta be erased first. Um, so you might ask, well, why not just have 256K blocks and uh, just erase everything at a time and then rewrite the whole block? And the answer is that erasure is very slow. And if you're not modifying bits, you absolutely do not want to write them because you're going to wear it out. Okay, and so um, really this distinction between the size of the erasure and the size of the read and write is something that you want to keep in mind when you're dealing with this. Okay. Now. Uh, there's a couple of things that SSDs provide for you. So one of the things is on the flash controller, there's actually a layer of indirection. It's kind of uh, very analogous to what we just came through with virtual memory. So there's something like a page table that maps uh, the operating system's view of block numbers to the underlying uh, SSD's view of which flash blocks are being used. Okay, and so that layer of indirection uh, is there and helps uh, hide the weirdness of the flash from the operating system, okay? Um, the other thing is it gives you the ability to do copy on write, uh, 
uh, under the covers. So really, when you go to write a page, uh, what happens is the OS, uh, you actually end up writing a different uh, page, and then you remap it. And so that the old data is now basically garbage collected, and the new data is mapped into the same block as before. And so this flash, flash translation layer helps hide the underlying properties of the flash. All right. Um, so uh, the flash translation layer, I guess I already said this, no need to erase and rewrite the entire 256K block. There's a lot of uh, that's handling this, OK? And uh, yes, as, as uh, said on the chat here, everything in, in CS is a layer of indirection. Um, what do you do with the old versions of the pages? They get garbage collected in the background. Um, and old blocks uh, that have uh, no active pages in them get erased and put on free lists and so on. OK. Now I wanted to show you some quote unquote current SSDs. So here is uh, the Seagate Exos SSD. This is from a couple of years ago, but um, they haven't actually updated this family uh, right now. But this is 15 terabytes. Um, it also has the dual 12 gigabyte interface like that Exos drive I showed you earlier. Notice that the sequential reads and writes are up in the uh, much faster, okay? Writes are fast because they're basically going to blocks that are already free. But um, notice this is like 860 megabytes per second as opposed to 270. So this is like a factor of three faster. Um, and uh, Amazon's price for this particular disk is uh, 54.95, which gives us about 0.36 gigabytes or dollars per gigabyte as opposed to three uh, cents per gigabyte, um, like we said earlier. So 36 versus three. This is my favorite. Uh, hard to believe drive. So here is a disk drive, and I say that in quotes, that's the same form factor as all the other ones you're used to, but it's 100 terabytes. Okay, that's 100 terabytes. Um, and it can do 500 megabytes per second. Uh, and it's about $40,000, which is about 4.4 gigabytes per second. So about, or excuse me, 0.4 dollars per gigabyte or 40 cents per gigabyte, okay? And what's really interesting about this is despite the fact that these guys wear out if you write them uh, too much, this company actually uh, guarantees that you can have an unlimited number of writes to this drive for five years. Can anybody guess why, even though Flash wears out, that they could tell you you can have unlimited writes for five years? Why would they even give that as a warranty if Flash wears out? Yeah, so the problem here is to fill out, to fill up this drive uh, is gonna take way too long to do. And so basically uh, you could be writing at maximum speed for five years and you wouldn't overwrite things enough to wear them out, <laughs> okay? And so they're, they're comfortable saying you can write as all, all you want for five years and you'd be fine, all right? And uh, notice part of that is the flash translation layer. Every time you write the same block, and I say that in quotes, you're really writing different blocks. And so it's doing what's called wear leveling, where it's making sure that as you overwrite things, it's making sure that every one of those pages on in all of those 100 terabytes are all used equally uh, well. And so if you were to try to write uh, at your absolute maximum rate for five years, you'd never get anywhere close to wearing any of the bits out. And so they can actually make that guarantee. But um, Anyway, that's my, uh, my favorite ridiculously large drive. Okay. So um, let's see. So basically hard disk uh, cost and, uh, and uh, SSD costs, hard disk SSDs have been basically going toward um, merging for a long time. And they're pretty much, they're pretty close these days here. I'm not gonna go through that any much, much more. Um, I wanted to tell you this, which is kind of fun. So. Uh, if, if you're aware of the Kindle, so I'm sure all of you have seen them before, they're a really cool reading device. I love them uh, myself. The thing that's cool about them versus pretty much any other LCD device is that you can read them in full sunlight. And so if you're a, a fan of books, you get yourself a real Kindle, you can kick your feet up in the sun and just read. And um, there's an amusing calculation you might ask, which is suppose that I take an empty Kindle right after I bought it from Amazon and I fill it with books, is it heavier? Okay, so that seems like a ridiculous question, but let's answer that. 
And the answer is actually yes, but not much. OK, and so let's go through this. So flash, as I mentioned, works by trapping electrons. So the erase state is actually lower energy than when you write a 1 on there, where you put some electrons in there and trap them. So you got higher energy uh, for uh, one of the bits. Okay, It doesn't really matter whether those are 1s or zeros. And assuming, for instance, the original Kindles came out with 4 gigabytes of flash, um, if you imagine that a full Kindle, half of the bits are uh, ones and half are zeros, then half of them are of high energy state. And you could compute for a typical flash transistor what the high energy state is. It's about 10 to the minus 15 joules. So a full king Kindle is about uh, one atogram heavier than an empty one. And you're, you can use actually uh, E equals MC squared here uh, with the energy to come up with how much uh, weight it is. So it's actually heavier, except that except that, of course, 10 to the minus 18 grams or an atogram is um, unmeasurable because the, the best measure, uh, best scales out there can't measure something finer than 10 to the minus 9 grams. So uh, the other thing is there's a whole bunch of other caveats. So you have to take the Kindle, set it to a constant temperature, uh, fill it with books, uh, cool it back to that temperature, recharge it, and then there'll be a 10 to the minus 18 grams. So um, this weight dif difference ends up being overwhelmed by battery discharge and all that sort of stuff. But it's amusing nonetheless. And my sources, by the way, are this guy, John Kubitowicz. There was a New York Times uh, column in 2011, which was pretty funny. So the New York Times called me up and said, uh, we have this question from a uh, somebody reading our column, and they'd like to know if Kindles are heavier when you put books in. And so I wrote about why this was. All right. So you can, this is a great party thing, right? So one of the things I love to do in 162 is I like to help you all out with parties. Now, of course, uh, unfortunately, our parties are all virtual these days, or they should be. But, um, you know, you can imagine that you're you're on your Zoom with, with the other 50 people in your party, and um, all of the parties have too much milk. Yes, that's true. And, uh, and then you can say, did you realize that when you fill a Kindle with books, it's heavier, all right? And you'll be, you'll be the most popular person uh, at, your, at that party. OK. So what about SSDs to summarize? So the pros versus hard disk drives, so they're low latency, high throughput. Um, uh, we can completely eliminate the seek and rotational delay. There's no moving parts, so they're much uh, very lightweight. The power is low. They're silent. Turns out they're extremely shock uh, insensitive, so you can drop things without jarring the bits. Um, uh, by the way, uh, you can't quote me on uh, dropping a laptop and being OK. I'm just talking about the SSD. Um, you can read them at memory speeds, essentially, although the writes are, are a little slower. The cons are that the storage is small relative to disks. But as you can see, SSDs, uh, if you're willing to pay exorbitant amounts of money, you can get um, very big disks, OK? So in fact, that small storage thing isn't really true anymore. Um, and the hybrid alternative that was asked about earlier is to combine small SSD with a large hard disk, OK? And that really what that does is it gives you the ability to do really fast writes to the disk without having to seek. And really fast reads, it serves as a cache, OK? And so some of the other cons, though, is there's an asymmetric block write performance. So you have to uh, read page, erase, write page to really change any data on, on a disk or on a uh, block. And the, uh, the drive lifetime is a little bit limited. So you're limited to about 10,000 writes per page for uh, modern NANs. And so the average fail rate is about six years, uh, life expectancy maybe 9 to 11 years. But uh, if you write a lot and you don't have an extremely huge drive like the one I showed you earlier, there really is a danger of lo losing some bits. Okay. Um, things are changing pretty rapidly, though. Now, one thing I did want to show you is another option, which is kind of fun, which is nanotube memory. So this is uh, something. Uh, so nanotubes, unfortunately, uh, perhaps my, uh, my camera image is covering this up, but nanotubes are made out of carbon molecules and they're, they're uh, tubes of carbon, okay? And you can put a bunch of them in uh, a pattern, pattern and you can actually arrange so that they're either uh, randomly uh, together or they have uh, 
they're attracted one way or another. And so you can actually have two different uh, resistances that you can detect, and that gives you ones and zeros. And there's a way to uh, clear by erasing, which basically means put it back into the, uh, you know, one of the states. And the interesting thing about this is this doesn't wear out, okay? Because you're just moving the nanotubes around. And so um, it doesn't wear out like flash. It's uh, persistent, so you don't have to worry about losing the contents. And it's as small as DRAM cells, okay? And so there's, for instance, a company called Nantero, which uh, has been very close and been working with DRAM manufacturers to produce uh, these cells. And this could potentially replace DRAM because it's as fast and dense as DRAM, holds its contents, and uh, doesn't have a wear out problem. So um, that's a pretty exciting possibility to come up soon. I think this is going to fundamentally change the way people think about memory once this becomes mass produced. Um, and they had already figured out how to pretty well produce these, and they were working with several uh, DRAM manufacturers a couple of years ago. So, um, of course, who knows exactly what's happening uh, because of the pandemic has sort of screwed everybody up, but um, this will be fun. All right, so let's shift. Well, unless anybody had any questions on devices, I want to shift gears to some performance to talk about that. Are there any other questions about devices? So this uh, uh, nanotube memory is actually uh, three-dimensional patterning as well as possible. So this will be really dense. Okay. So the difference between PCIe and SATA 3 is those are two different buses. Uh, PCIe uh, is used for, uh, is a pretty common interface to plug cards and stuff in, whereas SATA 3 is something that was set up to um, specifically for disk drives. And so they're for slightly different uses. Um, DNA storage has been interesting for a long time, but I haven't yet seen a good uh, proposal for how to make it as dense as regular DRAM yet. Um, but of course, we all know that DNA is very uh, dense, uh, but that would be fun at some point. Um, do any of these use less uh, heavy, rare, toxic me uh, metals? That's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not sure the answer to that. The nice thing about Nantero's uh, nanotubes is the biggest thing here is carbon, which um, it'd be great to uh, extract that from the atmosphere and use it. But uh, um, in terms of things like cobalt and some of these other things, unfortunately, patterning of chips is, is not necessarily as environmentally friendly as one might like. But I don't have any reason to suspect that this uh, nanotube is, is worse than other ones, and it might actually be better. So that's a good question, though. Um, so let's talk about performance for a moment. So when we're talking about these disks or we're talking about schedulers or whatever, there are several things we might talk about. And I thought I would just put these on the table for a moment. So for instance, latency, time to complete a task. It's often measured in units of time, seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, maybe hours, maybe years, right? Um, response time is kind of the time uh, to initiate an operation and get the response back. So latency, is time, whereas response time often re is a round trip, right? It's from the time the, the quest went out to come back, okay? And sometimes the ability to issue uh, the, uh, the next response, the next uh, request might depend on when you got the response, because not all systems can handle pipelining of, of requests, okay? A, a different thing is throughput, okay? So throughput or bandwidth is typically the rate at which we can send tasks or bytes, those are two possibilities, uh, into something, okay? And it's often measured in units of things per unit time. So like operations per second or uh, giga, giga um, operations per second or bytes per second, megabytes per second. So often in networking, you might see megabytes per second, right? Megabits per second. Um, and then another thing which uh, ties into all of these is the startup or overhead which is often the time to initiate an operation. Now, overhead fits into latency, of course, but um, if you can pipeline and send several things at once, sometimes you can um, only pay the overhead at the first one, and then the rest of them are run at full rate. Um, now, most I.O. operations are roughly linear, 
um, where if you have B bytes, the latency um, is the overhead plus B divided by transfer capacity. And so that overhead actually uh, directly impacts your latency. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, when somebody talks about performance, the first question you ought to ask is, uh, what am I measuring, you know, and is it relative to something? So for instance, performance might be operation time. It might be rate. It might be any number of things. So you could talk about uh, low latency is a high performing thing, or you could talk about high throughput being a high performing thing. Okay. Um, this is, you're talking about what this is. This is global glops. I think that's just a typo. Sorry about that. Um, so for instance, in a network, suppose we have a one gigabit per second link. Everybody's got those. Um, you probably got them on your laptops. Um, the bandwidth um, might be uh, 125 megabytes per second, right? So this is gigabits per second per link, megabytes per second. Okay, that's just uh, dividing one gigabyte, gigabit by eight. All right, suppose the startup cost is a millisecond. We could take a look at a graph like this. So notice this is a double-headed graph. It's got packet size on the bottom. It's got latency in blue on the left and bandwidth in uh, red on the right. And if you notice the latency, because this is linear, the latency is really uh, the startup cost plus um, the size of my packet B over the bandwidth. So here's my size of my packet. What I showed you there for latency is a nice linear graph. And notice that at the zero inter intercept, uh, there's a minimum of a, a thousand microseconds or a millisecond because that's my overhead. And so if I were to look at the bandwidth of this, the effective bandwidth, yeah, this thing is a gigabit per second or 125 megabytes per second. But if I were to look at the effective bandwidth taking overhead into account, I get this, this uh, red curve, all right? And I just take the packet size divided by the latency, okay, to send um, that packet. And that gives me uh, effectively bytes or bits per, per second or whatever I'm measuring. And um, it has this shape to it, okay? And this shape um, starts out uh, low, right? Because my bandwidth starts out at zero for small packets, and that's because the overhead's so high. Once I make the packet big enough, then my bandwidth starts getting higher. And in fact, at some point it levels out because no matter how big my packet is, I can't go faster than uh, the, the raw 125 megabytes per second, okay? And so one place that can be interesting here is what's called the half power bandwidth, which is the point at which my effective bandwidth is equal to half of my total bandwidth, all right? And that's, uh, for instance, here, if my packet is 125 kilobytes, then my effective bandwidth uh, is at half of my full bandwidth, okay? Um, so just because you have a gigabyte, excuse me, gigabit per second link doesn't mean you get a gigabit per second. In fact, you often don't unless you have really big packets. Uh, what's also interesting here is if our startup cost is 10 milliseconds, notice how I had the overhead of one millisecond here. If I change it to something more like a disk, say 10 milliseconds, uh, and I do the same computation, what you find here is that the half power point is not until 1.25 gigabytes in size. So I have to have really, really, really large packets before I come anywhere close to getting half of my native bandwidth. <laughs> so um, that's a problem. Okay. Um, oh yeah, sorry, this is 1.2 megabytes. I'm, my apologies. I, I added three extra zeros in my brain there. Okay, so overhead really matters. And see this huge, this huge zero packet size latency gets into play. And so when we wanna do a good job of optimizing things, when we start building file systems and networks and stuff on top of devices, we're gonna have to be very sensitive to the overhead. So what determines the peak bandwidth for I.O.? So that was, for instance, that you know, one gigabit per second. Well, it's uh, the hardware. And so you can look at a bunch of buses. We've talked about things like the original PCI buses um, was 133 megahertz at 64 bits per lane. Um, Thunderbolt, which is a um, USB-C style connection, 40 gigabits per second. So the, the bus speeds have been continually getting bigger. Um, the, uh, Device transfer bandwidth is going to give me my peak bandwidth off of a disk, okay? And so that has something to do with the rotational speed of the disk. Uh, 
or the right read rate of the NAND flash, that gives me my peak bandwidth, which is what I start with in a calculation like this. So my peak bandwidth is this one gigabit per second, and then the overhead takes over, okay? And so that peak bandwidth comes in many forms, and whatever the bottleneck is in the path is the thing that's gonna limit my peak bandwidth, okay? And we're gonna talk a lot more about this next time. So the overall performance for an IO path, which is where we're gonna wanna get, might look like this. You have a user thread, they make system calls and their request gets queued and then eventually goes to the controller and the IO device. I already showed you this um, earlier when I was talking about the disk drives. The interesting thing that's uh, the elephant in the room we haven't talked about is this queue. The mere existence of the queue with uh, random inputs times causes this curve. Okay, and so hopefully by the time we get through our discussion on queuing theory, you'll have a much better idea why this curve goes up as we get closer to 100%. So that 100%, we're first gonna try to understand what 100% throughput means or utilization. And that's really finding our peak bandwidth that's possible to get through the device and getting, as we get close to that in our requests, you'll find that it isn't that we linearly increase, uh, but instead we get this behavior where the curve actually climbs toward infinity if we're doing this uh, in modeling as we get close to 100%. And we're hopefully gonna try to explain that. But for the, for the time being, what's important is the fact that this curve is very nonlinear. It's not linear like I was implying with these previous slides. And so if it's nonlinear, you're gonna wanna be careful. You're never gonna wanna be operating over here because your latency is gonna be ridiculously high just to get a little bit more performance out of the system or a little bit more utilization. And so instead, we're gonna want something more like a half PowerPoint or the point at which um, we stop kind of doing a linear gain with utilization and start getting into the, the rapid growth, okay? All right, and we're gonna explain that more. So just to start the discussion for next time, uh, sequential server performance is kind of what you think about when you say, well, um, it takes, uh, I have a request, this blue one, it takes L to complete, and I have a series of them. And as long as the server, be it a disk or whatever, can handle uh, L of the, you know, ha can handle this at the rate it comes in, I'm good to go, okay? So a single sequential server that uh, takes time L to do a task um, operates at a rate that's, uh, less than or equal to one over L on average in steady state. So notice that I'm getting maximum behavior out of this server because I'm putting these uh, L items together and, um, and I put it, I'm squishing them together as tightly as possible. And so for instance, if it takes 10 milliseconds for me to process something, then the maximal rate I can get out of that server is gonna be uh, one over L or about hundred ops per second. Um, if L is for instance, two years, it's possible I'll only get 0.5 operations per year. Okay, and so this latency L to do, a, to do an operation in the server is gonna be something we need to compute. And that's possibly related to things like, you know, uh, seek plus rotation plus transfer on a disk or transfer time off of flash and so on, okay? But as you can imagine, this is looking really nice and linear, but that graph I showed you earlier wasn't nice and linear. Um, another version, by the way, of something simple here is a pipeline idea where um, you've got three operations, you've got um, to do three things, each of which takes uh, time L, and I can um, do them in different stages. So I first do the blue, then the gray, then the green, and I can pipeline those in the following way. Okay, this probably rings a bell from 61C. But in that instance, depending on how many pipeline stages I've got or K pipeline stages, my effective rate is higher, okay? Because if L is 10 milliseconds, but I can do four stages at a time, I get 400 ops per second rather than what I had is 100 ops earlier. So we're gonna wanna start analyzing our systems as can we get any pipeline out of them as well? Okay. And I think uh, examples of pipelines are all over the place. So for instance, you know, here's a user process causes a sys call, which queues in the file system, which then goes into the upper device driver, which queues there, which goes in the lower device driver and so on. Or in a network, we've got communication. There's a whole bunch of queues throughout the network. Um, so anything with queues is going to start invoking queuing theory. Um, so we're going to have to analyze it there. And you're going to find out that unlike what I just showed you, it's not linear. Uh, it's going to have that unfortunate 
uh, curve to it, all right? And we're gonna hope to identify that as we get forward. Um, and unfortunately, real systems have these cues and have that nonlinear behavior. So it's not synchronous or deterministic like it was in 61C. All right, I'm gonna let you go. But in conclusion, we, uh, we talked about notification mechanisms today. We talked about interrupts and polling. Um, where polling is re uh, reporting the results by actually asking the status register what's going on. And we talked about how do we, can, we can combine interrupt and polling to maybe get lower overhead. Uh, we talked about device drivers, which interface to the IO devices and give you a clean read, write, open interface to the operating system above. And they manipulate devices through things like programmed IO. That's where the uh, processor reads uh, each thing at a time or DMA. Um, and we talked about the uh, three types of uh, devices that device drivers have to deal with. We talked about block devices, character devices, and network devices. We also talked about DMA to permit devices to directly access memory. So typically the device driver running in the operating system asks the device, go ahead, please transfer this data to that uh, part of memory and tell me when you're done. Okay. And uh, one of the things we didn't talk about today, but you can imagine is, oh, actually we did, we did talk about it, is while that transferring is going on, it's possible that either the operating system had to have pre-invalidated the cache or the DMA has to invalidate the cache as it goes. Uh, we talked about disks and disk performance. We talked about queuing time plus controller time plus seek time plus rotational plus transfer, transfer time. We talked about rotational latency being a half of a rotation on average. And the transfer time is, uh, depends on the rotation speed, the bit storage density, and as we talked about, it depends on whether you're reading from the outside track or the inner one. Um, devices have very complex interactions and performance characteristics. We've just started this um, discussion. So the queuing plus the overhead plus the transfer time. Um, and that's our latency. Okay, And we talked about how overhead can make a huge difference and you need large block sizes to deal with that. And then we talked about how different devices like a hard disk versus an SDD um, basically have different uh, performance measurements, all right? Um, and systems, as I've already alluded, are basically gonna be designed to optimize performance and reliability. Um, and that me means we need to know something about the underlying devices. So even though we have these interfaces to shield us from knowledge, we need to know something more um, about the devices to really use them at their uh, maximum performance. All right. And uh, what we're going to find out next time is that bursts and hydralization introduce all sorts of queuing de delays. And that's going to be the source of that growth without bound in our performance curve from earlier. All right. I think we're good to go for today. Um, I'm going to let you go. And um, that's S SSD. That's a typo. Good catch. Um, and so I'm going to wish everybody good luck on tomorrow's exam. I'm sure you all do well. And uh, we'll see you on Monday.